the most important ones. But I just had to pick, select them randomly so that um, I can actually cover them within the um, time allotted to me. I think I have between 45 minutes and 50 minutes, and I'll try as much as possible to keep to the time. So we would see how some of these things can be practically demonstrated. So we go straight into injection without wasting much of our time. Now here, injection, just like from the word, you are injecting something into another body. Like you get into the hospital, you the, the nurse or the doctor get the injection and inserts it into you. So this is more like you are inserting something into another thing. Now, let's look at the balance of um, application security. Most of the time you find out that um, hackers or um, malicious entities come around and they drop some form of codes or some form of um, malicious input into the input field. Sometimes it can be in the input field. Sometimes it can be in the browser, the browser um, URL, the address bar that you have up there. So, and that is what we call, um, what do we call that? Uh, that's what we call the surface area in this case. Now, the surface area simply refers to areas where hackers or attackers can actually inject their code. So it usually comes in um, the input that you have on your forms or it comes on the browser URL. So you have to do as much as possible as an application security engineer. Try as much as possible to ensure that your browser address bar is secured enough not to accept malicious codes. You also have to try as much as possible to ensure that your um, input, I mean, the input boxes on your forms do not accept malicious entity. Even if they accept them, they should find a way to um, sieve or filter what is meant to go to the database. Now, the thing is, whatever you enter on the input is actually sent to the back end. Now, I, for those that are not really application developers here, I will simply, um, I'll quickly tell you what the structure of an application looks like. You have the front end, usually, that is written in HTML5. In the middle, you have JavaScript. And at the back end, you now have your programming languages. It could be Java, it could be PHP, it could be um, C Sharp, that's ASP.NET. It could be any of, it could be Python, it could be any of these programming languages. So you can see the architecture from the front, which is HTML. And the middle, you have the JavaScript. And the back, you have Java, C Sharp, or PHP, or Python. Now, the thing is, whatever, now, it is in front, which we call the, um, the front end. That is the, the, the front part of the application that is exposed to the users of the application. Now, in front there, that is where the users actually interact with your application. Whatever they send will pass through the middle, then it will eventually get to the back end. So that is what we call the MVC pattern, the model, the view, and the controller. So the model is the back end. The view is the front end. The controller sits in between um, the two of them. So whatever you enter from your form or from your browser address bar is sent to the middle way, and finally it gets to the back end. The back end is the one that eventually interacts with the database to fetch data or to insert data into the database. So it is garbage in, garbage out. Once you enter garbage from the front end, it is the same garbage that is passed to the middle way and then to the back end. Now, once it gets to the back end, then it can actually um, cause problems for the back end. Usually, you know, the back end, apart from the back end codes, you have the database where you have the data. And we say the data is the most valuable asset of any organization. So once you enter garbage into, um, or it's not necessarily garbage, any malicious entity, once you enter it, and it eventually gets to what we term as the most um, important or most valuable asset of an organization, sometimes it can bring it down. That is, you, it can delete all the data in the database. Sometimes it can fetch by stealing information from the database. Sometimes it can lock out people. It can do a lot of havoc. Now, when havoc is done to what we see as the most valuable item or asset of that organization, then that organization 
can easily um their reputation is at stake in that case so it simply means you really have to take care of what is happening on the front end now what, what happens let's be a little bit practical now now what really happens why does this thing happen it's simply because the interpreter now what about code you write there's an interpreter that interprets it in a language that the database will understand so i believe for those that are developers you must have heard of database connectivity like you have jdbc you have OD, jdbc is for java odbc is for um c sharp that's microsoft asp.net and all of that so whatever you enter you know i mentioned the fact that at the back end apart from the back end code you also have the database so whatever you enter needs to be interpreted for the database to understand now the interpreter itself is a very gullible entity whatever you send to it is what is passes on to the data to the um, database so it does not it does not question whatever you send to it it believes that whatever is sent to it is something genuine and that is not meant to be so so and that is um what um hackers are actually taking advantage of they know the interpreter is gullible it takes anything so whatever you submit to it from the front end is what it uses to relate with the database and that's why you find out that hackers and some malicious guys enter what is not expected or what is malicious and enters it sometimes it can bring down the database sometimes it can it can give you access to log into an account that is not meant to be yours or it can it can even add values to um things that are not meant to be there and it can actually do a whole lot of damage in that case so what really happens there is that the interpreter concatenates the untrusted data or the malicious data with the query now the query is on the back end the query is meant for the database to interact with the database now wh whatever you enter from the front end is bundled into the query and sent to the database so the database is just like a soldier is a one-way guy that whatever is sent to it is what it interprets and it fetches the data sometimes it brings down the database sometimes it does um any other thing now there are basically two types there's what we call the sql injection there's the one we call the os which is operating system injection now sql whether you're using my sql whether you're using um PostgreSQL, whether you're using MongoDB or you're using SQL Server, all of them are based on what we call the ANSI 99 um, standard. ANSI 99 standard defines um, a standard for um, coming up with a database management system. So all of them can be affected by SQL injection. So that is the first one. Then the other one is operating system injection. Some of the time we tend to write, or application developers tend to write um, codes that need to interact with the operating system. Now, some malicious guys now seizes, they, they, they seize the advantage in this case. They, they, they now write codes or some malicious items. They pass it from the front end and they, they send it to the operating system. Now, when they send it to the operating system, the operating system will not um, try to filter whatever is sent across to it. It will just interpret it. And most of the time, you it simply gives you access to be able to read files that, that do not belong to you, files that you do not have access to, and all of those things. So basically, those are the two things, SQL injection, OS injection. So let's see how this can be demonstrated real life. So um, you don't actually have access to this. For now, I think I am the only one um, in this case, except if I have to upload it for you guys to have access to it. Now, this is what I call the ARC board. I actually built this. I have a version in Java. I have a version in PHP. I have a version in .NET. It's this same ARC board I used to upload my training on Cybrary. So you can, if you want to get the full details of what's happening on the ARC board, you can actually um, subscribe. It's a paid um, class or paid training on Cybrary. So, but I'm just going to be picking one or two of them based on today's class. The first one is SQL injection. I'm still going to um, stick to my time, the 45 minutes to 50 minutes I'm given. So at some point I may be a little bit faster than normal. So, but if there's 
key points you feel you're not clear with, you can easily um, call my attention to that. Now, this is SQL injection. These are some of the things that SQL injection can actually cost you. I click on that. Now, for you to have access, so the scenario here is you want to be able to have access to your wallet. You know, in your wallet, you have your PIN, you have your password, you have your age, you have all those account details. So, for example, um, I am a normal person. I mean, a legit, I want to carry out a legitimate login. So, for example, I enter a mark, which is my user ID, and my password is um, 123. Yeah. So, once I click submit, it goes. You can see um, these are my basic info. My username is a mark. My password is 123. I am 12 years old. Now look at my wallet information, my credit card, my PIN, my balance, my all of this. So these are my details. Now, what do we want to demonstrate here? I can also access this account even when I don't know my username and password. That means I can access your account even when I don't know your username and password. That is how we're going to show you how SQL injection actually works. Now, if you look at this, for example, I don't know somebody's username. I don't know the person's password. How do I access the person's account details? Now, this is what you do. I have a couple of codes here that I have tested and are functioning well. So I'm going to tell you how those codes work. Now, if you copy the whole of this, I will explain how it works to you. Now, the assumption is I don't know the username. I don't know the password. Now, look at it. I'm saying the username can be XX meaning that I don't know, or one equals one. You see, what we're saying here is, you see that the username is XX, which I don't know and I don't care, or one equals to one, because I know from now till eternity, one will always be equal to one. So once any of these statements is true, then the database will be open for me to have access to the data I need. Now, I can, I can even decide to remove all of this. Then I do. Now, in SQL, this is what we call comments. That means anything that comes behind it, disregard it. Anything that comes behind it, don't interpret it. Only interpret everything in front of it. You can see the way I am deceiving the interpreter that interprets things to the database. So now, look at what the backend code looks like. This is what your developer has done for you. It's saying select all from user. That means there's a table called user where username is whatever you enter as the username and password is whatever you enter as the password. That's what your developer is doing at the back end. Now, for a, for a um, guy who is trying to enter a malicious entity or a malicious um, item, what it simply does is he now wants to deceive the, um, the interpreter. So it says at this, this point, let the username be XX or one equals to one. He knows there might be a person, uh, there might not be anybody whose username is actually XX, but he knows that one will always be equal to one. But then he has now put this dash dash, which means comment. Now, putting comments here, look at it. It means that don't even bother about asking whether the database is correct. That means don't interpret what is behind it. Don't care about what comes after the dot, after the dash dash, because the SQL interpreter sees the dash dash as what? As a commenting style. There are two types of commenting in SQL. Um, in SQL, actually, I'll show you the second one. So here you have the dash dash. That means whatever comes behind it, don't care about it. Now, even when I don't know the password, now I'm going to submit. Let's see if it will go. You can see it has gone. So I have access to this person's account. You can see this is not even my username. This is another person's username. Why say this is his password? This is his age. You can see it's quite different from mine. Then you can see his credit card information. With this, you have successfully stolen somebody's card details. You have successfully stolen his personal information. And that is one of the avocs that SQL injection can actually do. Now, we can still do some more things. Okay, let me quickly show you the other commenting style. In case you don't want to use dash dash, you can decide to use this too, ash. You can see, so once I come here and I use this ash, 
Now, Ash also is a commenting style. It means that anything that comes after, you can see, I'm not entering anything on the password. It simply means that don't even care about the password. Don't care about whatever. Only focus on the username. Now, when the username is XX or one is equal to one, now, don't even bother about limits. I'm still coming there. Now, here, you have seen it. If you submit this, you can see it has also gone. Now, you have, so I've shown you two different ways of two different things that you can actually enter, either by using the dash dash or by using the hash. The two of them are actually two types of commenting styles in SQL that tells the interpreter to disregard anything that comes behind it. So that's just one way of doing it. Now, you can now access somebody's account details. The next thing is you want to see if you can access more than one person's account details. This is how to go about it. Now, that is where the use of um offsets and limits actually comes in so here um i'll go back to where i need to log in here i log this in now you're saying limit one offset one offset one means start from the first person now let me show you what the database looks like um where's the database the database that we're actually working on this is it so these are the people in the database you can see rules why say a max these are the three people in the database now if i actually want to see all of these people you know normally as an end user you won't have access to what is you won't have access to this that i'm showing you now you won't have access i mean to this database so but i just brought it up for you to be able to see the content of the database now i would go back now like a normal user and um here once i get there I'll do offset one. Offset one means start from, I mean, after the first person, then check the other people, like check the other people's details. So let's see, submit. You can see it goes. You can see it has shown rows because rows is the second person on the database. You can see rows is the second person on the database. If I want it to move to, um, if I want it to show me, the third person, I'll just do offset two. So once I do offset two, that means it will leave the first two persons and go, it will now go to the third person. You can see, quite say is the third person. So that is how you iterate until you get the details of everybody in that database. So that is SQL injection for you. Now, what I've just shown you is using SQL injection to fetch people's details, but you can also use it to delete database, to insert items in the database, simply by using this kind of um, malicious queries that have entered from the, um, from the front end. So time will not permit me to actually take you deeper into all of those things, but I hope someday we would have time to look at that. So that is SQL injection for you. So um, I'm actually open to questions before we move to the next one. Any question, please? Question? Do you have any question? Does anybody have question? Okay, if you don't have question, I have one question for you. What makes the SQL injection possible in this case? What makes SQL injection possible in this case? Can anybody answer that? Why is it possible? It's simply because the interpreter is gullible in the sense that it interprets whatever comes to it and it goes on like that. So that's just it. Now, the remediation, what can you do to remediate this kind of a thing? So what you can do to remediate it is ensure that whatever you enter on the front end, like here, whatever you enter on the front end, ensure that you filter it ensure that you validate it ensure that you check it you can do the checking from your javascript or even on the back end there's what we call layered security from the front end you validate once you get to the back end also do the validation by the time you do the validation at those two different points then you can be rest assured that the the extent to which or the level of havoc that it can that can be exploited as a result of SQL injection will be drastically minimized and that is just about that. So let's move on to um, 
the next one, which is cross-site scripting. I'm going to be brief about that as well. Now, cross-site scripting. Cross-site scripting also comes about, yeah, let's quickly take a look at what I have on my um, slide. Now, cross-site scripting is a widespread vulnerability that affects many web applications. It consists of injecting malicious client scripts. That means on the client, that is on the front end, people inject malicious scripts into it. And it will now, it will now, now, an unsuspecting user of the same application will now come and click on that thing. And once you click on that thing or on that malicious script, then it would have stolen your password, it would have stolen your credit card details, it would have stolen other details of you into, it would have transferred it somewhere else. And when that happens, then you are left at no mercy. It simply means that some details have been stolen from you. Now, let's look at it. If you go on Twitter, we all send our comments and all of that. This account now goes on Twitter. It now enters a malicious script on Twitter. And once it does that, you are not suspecting guy. For example, you see something like um, Buari simply says he's sorry about what happened um, on so 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 date in Lagos at Lekki Gate. Click on this link for those that are affected. You know, everybody will click on the link. Now, meanwhile, it is a parody account, it is not actually Buari's account. Now, if you click on that kind of a thing, you know, it will take you somewhere. And once it takes you somewhere, before you know it, your password or some other details have been stolen about you. Now, we don't need to say so much of the story because this is meant to be a practical demonstration. Now, look at what has happened here. People are entering comments, like I can enter a comment here. Let's say this is Twitter. I enter my comment like, um, um, rest in peace, heroes of end SAS. Now, you can see, once I submit, it goes, it says comment has been added. If you refresh, you can see, this is the comment I just um, entered. Rest in peace, heroes of answers. The date I entered it was this, the time was this. Who was that person? It is a mouth. So that's it. Now, another person can now, you know, for me, I'm a good boy. That's why I've not entered anything. Now, let's see what a bad guy can do. Now, I have the sample script that you can actually use here. Look at this, for example. Um, yeah, look at this. I copy that and I paste that here. It will also go. Look at it. Now it says location dot replace user blah 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 session story. I'll tell you how the hacker gets to know that there is a variable in the system that is called entry underscore your name. Can, can anybody see the screen where? If not. Is it readable to everyone? Can you say? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. So now look at it. The guy has entered this instead of a proper comment. But the actual thing, the main comment he has entered is actually click to get yours. Let's change it to something else. Like we can change it to um, speak directly to Buari. Speak directly. Directly to Buhari. Now, that's that's what the guy has done there. And um, look at the old, old script here that he has entered. You won't see that on the front end. And that is what happened. By the time he submits, you see comment has been added. Now, um, let me refresh now. By the time you refresh, oh, um, I guess something is, okay, I didn't copy it properly. So let me place it there. I didn't copy the stuff properly. So here, click to speak with Buhari. Now I submit. Mm. Excuse me. Okay, there's just one um, thing that was missing there. That's it, I guess. So once you submit, yes, comment has been added. So let me refresh it. 
So let me just go to the database, copy what I had earlier. Um, where is it? So just look at uh, what I'm trying to do there. Oh, let me just. Mm. I'm going to explain what the script does. Yeah, so this is it. It's this is saying win five million for free. It's real. Click this. We can even modify it to something else like click to meet Bwari. And then you so refresh, you can see. Who will see this kind of, of comment? I will not be interested. Win $5 million for free. It is real. Click to meet Buari and all of that. Now, you know, this message will be seen by everybody. Everybody will actually see it. But, and everybody will like to click it. Now, suddenly you click it. This is what happens. You can see, I've clicked it. And it's saying that I'm in the wrong place. Please use the back button. Um, unsuspecting, you just use the back button and you go back to your um to, to your link back you think nothing has happened but let me show you what has actually happened now you would observe let me click it again so that i would um crave your indulgence to what you should look after now look at this it has taken me to another domain that is hosted which is www.ismyhill.com.ng that is where it has taken me. Now, if you go to this particular guy, to this particular domain, there is a script there that is titled xxx.php. That's the name of the script. Now, let's go to this Ismail Hill. You know, an ordinary user will not even pay attention to this. You just think you have clicked something and nothing has happened. Now, let's go to ismailhill.com. Um, this is the database on ismailhill.com. And um, if you click on stolen credentials, while that is loading, look at the script that you can see. This is still ismail.com.ng. This is not on my laptop. This is in another domain that I don't even know where their server is. But I hosted a PHP script there that can steal username and passwords. That is the simple PHP script. But I'm not going to bore you so much about because if everybody might not be a developer in here so this is the script and this is what it does now if you look at it now let's go to the database of credentials that have been stolen by that script we'll look at the timing too now look at it today's date is 20 10 25 and then um, what's the time now this 3 45 look at it this 3 43 so i guess this happened two minutes ago so look at it it means that this username and password have been stolen in another domain like this domain is not my, my laptop i had to go to that domain ismail.com.ng although it is my domain but i kept a php script there so that anybody who clicks on that particular link that i showed you earlier this link um where is it yeah this link that i showed you earlier anybody who clicks on it it will simply take you there and your details should have been stolen. I don't know if you understand. Now, let me log in with something, somebody's um, details, another person's details here, yeah, so that we would see how that has been stolen. Now, um, let me quickly get that. Let's see. Let's say I'm going to log in with um, Rose. Rose password is 4567. So, Let's just go there. This is Rose, Rose, and password is 4567. And I click sign in. You can see I've signed in with Rose. Now, if I click here now, um, where is it? Cross-site scripting, evil link. If I come down and click the same link, 
I click. You can see it's saying in the wrong place. But let's go and check the database of that domain. If you go there, it's loading. That's why you have this um, there. So here, as it is loading, look at it. This is ismahill.com. Because Rose clicked on that link, is or our username and password have been stolen, and that's the end of the whole thing. So you can see clicking a link, how it can send your username and password to another domain that you don't even know about. So that is just it. Now let me just show you the analysis of the link that does that or the script that does that. Now look at this guy here. He says win five million naira for free. It is real, but you can see in the link all these ones did not show. Is only click to meet Buari like this one that shows. Now, it simply means that um, here, this is the script. It simply means that once anybody clicks, it, you can see on click, go to www.ismail.com.ng, xx. Now, once it gets to ismail.com.ng, look for a script called xx.php. Then, still, whatever comes like this. That's the username that is stored in the session variable, then the password that is also stored in the session variable. So it steals that. Now, the question you might want to ask me is, how do you know what the session username or what the session variable is? How do you know what the session variable is for username and for password? How do you know you're meant to type encrypt username, encrypt password? I have a script for determining that too. So what you just do is come here, you can you see all the scripts, javascript.alert, blah, blah, blah. It will show you all the variables, um, script variables that have been used on that system. Here, I'll just come, um, where is it? So let me just go back. So here, I'll remove everything here and I'll place that script. Mind you, it has to start with JavaScript. Then you place that full column there. And you can see, these are all the variables that have been used on this system. Look at it. Wallet bar, encrypt pin, wallet pin, encrypt CC. You can see encrypt uname, encrypt password. So if I wanted to pick other things from this system, then in that script, I would have included all of this. Then I will just be able to send those details to a remote server that nobody even knows where it is. I believe that is clear to you. So that is about cross-site scripting. Any question on that? Any question? Okay, now what is the remediation for this? The remediation is also that I have, now the problem is that I was allowed to enter scripts inside the comment box. So as a developer, you have to ensure that you have a specific length of items that people can enter into the field. They cannot enter more than that. And it does not accept scripts. Like things like this, it does not accept it. You shouldn't accept things like, um, where is it? Like this, we call it anchor. You shouldn't allow that. You get, you shouldn't allow things like all these things that we call anchor. It is because they are allowed. That is why, you know, if you look at this, it only shows click to meet Buari, it didn't show all the scripts. It is because it allows all those anchor to go there. So one way of um, preventing this is what we call encoding and decoding. Whatever comes in, encode it and decode it. Ensure that whatever you are presenting to the user um, um, does not come with those scripts. Anything that looks scripty is, is, is stopped or is bad from being displayed on the screen. So that is just about um, cross-site scripting. There is actually more to that, but for the time given, I have to be able to manage that to discuss that. So the next one we're going to be looking at is the XML entities. So let me take you back to my, um, um, what's it called? My slide. Now, according to Wikipedia, XML external entity is a type of attack against an application that passes XML input. Now, the, you can see everything is about input, input, input. I'll show you what an XML document looks like. Um, so it's here on my desktop. So um, here, XML, 
Yeah, this is a very good example of an XML document. Can you see that, everybody? Can you see this, everybody? Yes, yes. I can. Great. Now, this is an XML document. Now, for those of you that are developers, you notice that there are basically two, or there are two common ways of transferring information between APIs or between applications and all of that. Usually, you use XML or you use JSON. And that's why we keep preaching that you should, you should prefer JSON over XML. XML has some vulnerabilities, and I'm going to be showing you some of those vulnerabilities. But for those, for those that do not know what an XML document looks like, this is what it looks like. We use it to transfer information from one point or from one application to another endpoint. That is it. So um, up till today, InterSwitch still uses this. I've, um, I've, I've, um, what's it called? I've um, had to use their application on some applications I developed, and they use XML for you to be able to send some information from your front end to their endpoint. So that's just it. So you can see credit card, this person's details, and the bio, and all of that. So there is what we call an XML parser. The XML parser will now interpret this and fetch out the important items like bank name, city bank, credit card number, the PIN, the balance, and all those things. It fetches it and sends them as raw data to the database. So all these um, syntaxes would it to the database. So that's what the XML parser does. It sees it, removes the non-important things and removes and takes the important ones and drop them in the database. So that's just what it does. So this is a very good example of an XML um, document. Now, you will notice that this starts with only the version and it does not have any other thing. So this is what we call a well-formed XML. That is what we call the well-formedness of an XML document. Now, look at an, another XML document. You can see I have some types here. I have the one you call the good boy. I just named it good boy. And there's another one that can cause DDoS. Let me show you what it looks like. <clears throat> now, look at it. It simply means the same kind of document. Okay. Let me just open with um, Notepad. Now, you can see it's the same type of document, but it has this, you can see doc type, although it has this normal thing on top, which is the version and the encoding standard. But this one now has special thing. Now, this is also a well-formed document, but you, it is, you are allowed to specify the document type. But this hacker has done something. He has added some kind of variables, like foo stands for any, bar stands for world, C1 stands for bar and bar. That means C1 stands for world because bar is world. Another bar is world. Now T2 stands for T1. And you know T1 is world, world. So that means you have world, world. World, world. You have world, world. You have world, world. And it goes like that. So this is like eight words in word. Now you now have T2. So T2 stands for eight. Another T2, eight. Another, you can go on and on like that. Now, you know what happens with DDoS? DDoS happens when the server, when the server's capability to respond to query has been overwhelmed. Now, let's say your server can only, um, can only undo, let's say, 1,000 words at a particular time. Now, somebody is now overwhelming it with like 1 million words. You know the server will shut down. And that is what we're trying to illustrate here. Now, you notice that here, some things have been repeated. Now, look at it. Bank is now a variable. That means anywhere you have bank, like in this place, it's not only Citibank that will show. It will show Citibank. Then it will also show this world in multiples, like, like thousands of them. So you will now be seeing, you know, in your database, you have, this, you have defined the data width. Let's say the data size, let's say 35, 45. Now here, you are sending bulk of information to the database. Now the, inform the database server will become overwhelmed and sometimes it might shut down. That is an example of DDoS. Now let me just illustrate that here. Um, where is it? XML entities. That is what we call billion laugh attack, where you um, tend to implement, where you tend to include several words 
to the server and you send the you know this kind of a thing can even occupy the network bandwidth and it will prevent other people from being able to access the server because you are sending loads of data to the data to the back end and that's a very big problem now when only you you are sending thousands and millions of words to the back end other people will not be able to have access through the um through their um, network infrastructure to that particular server and that is also called denial of service so this is a very good example now here um for one reason or the other let's say interswitch expects me to upload um this particular document the one i called good boy where is it um yes i upload it and i submit you can see it says file already exists so that means i have uploaded that before now you know from the front end i've uploaded it to interswitch what happens here is that um the admin on the back end will now come to pierce it you can see this is the good boy that i uploaded the guy will now come and pierce it you know what if you say they, they have what you call xml parser that will check the data and fetch whatever you have there then send it to the back end now once it clicks the paste button you can see it has picked you can see this is no longer xml this is now json that your application can now interpret that's what happens at the back end but now bad guys are now using that advantage they will okay you want me to upload xml i will upload xml now when your application will now read it it will now send multiple uh, data in their multiples to the back end so here this is what happens now um there's another document the one i showed you earlier let's try and paste that one too the one i call ddos ddos.xml now see what happens once i paste it you can see dos is suspected server has crashed it simply means that it has noted it has noticed the the volume of things that is meant to be sent to the back end and that's why the server crashed if you click OK, you can see the thing is now, you can see bank, this is Citibank, but it's now showing world, 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 which are meaningless. Look at the credit card detail, but it's also showing world, world, meaningless things. And only um, the database server can no longer handle this. And in that case, they can either shut down or block the network for other people not to be able to have access to it. So let me show you that file that causes that again. It is because you have um it is because you have allowed this so what we tell people is if you are going to be working with xml on your application ensure that you filter it that all these kind of things are not allowed you can reject the xml tell the merchant or whoever you're dealing with that this kind of file is not you have, you must have coded it you must have looked out you must have stated either a blacklist or whitelist of the kind of xml you are looking out for after all the good boy file without it still works look at the good boy file it doesn't have the document type and all of that so you can try as much as possible to, to avoid document type and other things that can be they are legitimate things but the the you know the actual essence of this doc type element entity is that if there is something you don't want to keep repeating across the xml you just state it up here in the element so that you can reference it in the body of the xml file anywhere you need it but attackers now do more than is expected more than is expected of them so they just do anything and once they do any of such you know what happens it simply means that they overload the database they overload the network and the network can shut down and people don't have access to it it's exactly four o'clock and i think i've been able to take you through um all those things i have talked about the injection where you enter stuff from the front end and you have access to other people's credit card details and other things cross-site scripting where somebody enters a malicious script and you go there click on the link and it steals your username and password to another domain that you don't even know about you just notice that somebody has been able to log into your account then xml entities where um, some apis or some merchant expects developers to submit details in xml formats instead of json so um, hackers now use that opportunity to enter unnecessary details that can happen there you can even use it to steal the server configurations and all of that these are things i 
um, explained in the Cyberary video. You can just search for my name on Cyberary, Ayokunle Olani, and you find details of all of this there. So I believe that is um, um, a tip of an iceberg of some of these things we'll be discussing in application security. So application security generally encompasses measures taken to improve the security of an application by finding, fixing, preventing security vulnerabilities. You know, most of the time people just develop application, they just develop functionalities of application because of pressures on them. When they give you software project, the business guys are on your head. They just want you to churn out functionalities here and there. There's a big problem. Now, developers don't even think about the application security part of it. A lot of developers don't even know application security. So they don't even pay attention to that. They only focus on application development and that's functionality. You know, in the SDLC, life cycle, software development life cycle. You have um, requirement engineering, you have design, you have development, and you have the last one, which is testing, then implementation and deployment. Now, as you have all of this, you should also add them in security. That's why when we go to implement ISO 27001, which is information system management system, information security management system framework, we tell people to separate the two documents. Separate the document on functionality from the document on security testing. When you're doing security testing, you have to do SAST, which is um, um, static application security testing. You have to do DAST, dynamic application security testing. You have to do all this kind of testing before you release your application for public consumption. But because of pressure, everybody just wants to um, deploy their application for people to start using. So application security goes beyond just developing application. You have to test it, find vulnerabilities, and ensure, um, most importantly, you carry out what you call your source code review. I've been part of source code reviews of top applications in this um, country and even beyond this country. I can tell you that a lot of applications are still vulnerable. I can tell you that. I've been invited to a university where they act into their database and they add issues. You know what the hacker did? He even deleted the log file and they, they, they knew something had changed on the database, but they didn't really know what happened because the guy even deleted the log file. So by the time we got there, we did all the um, investigation and all of that. Because the log file has been deleted, there was no way we could actually um, do much in that case. So what we just did was that we, we, you know, if you are a thief, if you steal something today and you are not caught, there's a tendency that you want to come back. So, so I wrote a script in, and I saved it in a location where it could not even go and delete. And eventually, we caught him when he logged in, the time he logged in, and what he did just because of the script, you can see. So it's good because they, they didn't care about application security testing. What they just cared about is they wanted a portal, somebody developed it for them it is functioning they don't care about what happens after that so we all really need to take application security very very serious and that is what OWASP top 10 OWASP.org is trying to do that is what they are trying to achieve so i believe um beyond this class we're still going to have some further events and then we'll come loaded and discuss a lot more things so i from my um slides i have referenced wikipedia I've, I've referenced some of my materials on cyberary and my experience so that's just it so lastly i must say a very big thank you for everybody that has been part of this um event once again my name is ayakunle if you need to contact me i am at amat at yahoo.com or you can simply click on this link search for ayakunle olani on um on linkedin or you simply send me a WhatsApp message on this phone number 2348025332286. So that is it. Thank you very much for your um, time. Talk over to you. Wow, wow, wow. Mr. Ayopole Olani, it's just as if uh, you should go on and Hello. Hello. Yeah, sorry, my I think uh, my network went off. Okay, okay. So we 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 truly enjoyed you, Mr. Olani Ayokunle. Is is as if um 
you should go on and on and on without stopping, but you just have to stop so that we'll have another thing to talk about next time. So we truly appreciate um, how you went over uh, the SQL injection, the CSS uh, scripting, and also the XML part, which um, I know every one of us here actually enjoyed. So I don't know, do we have any question for Mr. Yokunle? Does anybody 